Hey, sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown. Well, Game 3 didn't go as most people might have expected, and certainly I didn't expect it to do that. Uh, it opened up pretty excitingly, where they, both teams were going back and forth and shooting at a very high percentage, um, but it quickly devolved into a route by the Heat. This game wasn't very close at all uh, once we got into the end of the second quarter or so, and um, I got a lot to talk about as far as coaching goes because it's been, it's been very confusing to me a lot of the time how the NBA coaching uh, staffs work because there are so many times over the years where I'll be scratching my head wondering, they have all these assistants and they all have these micro jobs. One guy's in charge of the offense, someone else is in charge of the defense. But in the game time decisions, when there aren't a lot of adjustments being made or certain plays aren't being run that seem to work very well, you have to wonder just what they're doing down there and why somebody isn't whispering in the coach's ear or writing a little note and handing it to him or something because, quite frankly, what we showed in our breakdown of Game 2 did not come play to form in Game 3. And let's talk first about what um, the Heat were doing. Now, the Heat in Game 1 ran a lot of horns on offense. They also ran a lot of a, of a play designed for Cole or for Chalmers where he get a, a pitch back and then a screen and roll on the sideline. And uh, and then they went from there of a game which they won to game two which they didn't run horns. I think they ran horns once, okay, after running horns a dozen times in game one. And then the other play with Norris Cole I described to you, they didn't run at all. And so it was very, very uh, strange to me that you can go from one game to the next and have such radically different offensive sets and run radically different offensive things. Um, as a player, it would probably be hard to develop a rhythm doing it that way uh, because what you want to be able to do is by the, by the conference finals, you should have your basic sets and the ways for the players to know how to score. Um, you know, the triangle offense is something that I run and I love, and part of the reason is that, A, it's, it's what they now call read and react, whatever, but the point of it is is that the, the players get to a comfort level with it where they know what positions they can play in and what kind of shots they can get. But when you do something like the Heat do, then from game to game, you never know what kind of shots you're going to get. So it's not surprising to me that Cole would have 12 points one game and zero the next or Mario Chalmers. Now, listen, we all know that LeBron is going to get his points no matter what. He's that good. And he would get his points in any kind of offense. It doesn't matter. But it's the other players and the role players that need to be able to have that role. So it's no surprise to me that uh, Shane Battier had two of the worst games of his career because – they're not running anything with any kind of continuity. Um, now let's get to the Indiana offense because, likewise, they found something in Game 2 that really hurt the Heat. And we showed you that in our Game 2 breakdown. The high pick and roll with Hibbert, um, especially on the sideline where he can then uh, roll toward the middle, was killing the Heat. Now, if they had done it and we had seen a, uh, some sort of adjustment by the Heat to rotate up higher or quicker or not be so aggressive on the double team of the ball handler, then I would say, okay, they should move away from it. But they simply didn't run it. So I did some charting in the second half, okay, because I was really curious to see how often, you know, if they recognized in game two how well it worked, they barely ran it in the first half. Although you can argue that they were doing okay on offense, so it almost, it almost didn't matter, and that's fine. So the third quarter was big. They were down by 10. They needed to, you know, get good shots and attack the Heat defense. They ran exactly one pick and roll with Hibbert on top in the third quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, they did two. But by then, the game was over. And in the second one, uh, there was an offensive foul on Hibbert because he was clearly frustrated, maybe because they weren't running that play, and it was a turnover. So... Um, very, very troubling to me that the, the, the number one thing that's going to hurt the Heat the most, they don't run at all. They don't even try to run it. It got so stagnant by the end of the third quarter, it was frightening. It's, you know, Hibbert was just relegated to standing on the, on the weak side, low block, away from the ball, and not being a threat. Now, remember, the other threat is him posting up. And they did it a little bit in the first half, but then again, hardly at all in the third quarter. So it boggles my mind they don't have a guy with all these advanced analytics and all these things that all at, the, at their fingertips, they don't have a guy charting. Now, what this reminds me of is Tex Winter. Tex Winter would chart every offensive play in the game. 
So at any time, he could tell you how many times they scored on pinch post, how many times they scored with a blind pig, what player was in that position. So that, and that, those are also key. Running high pick and roll isn't really going to get you anywhere unless it's Hibbert High with George Hill as a point guard. Okay? They tried to do it more with Paul George. And Paul George, is not, it's not his strongest suit to come off of pick and rolls. He turns the ball over a lot. He tries to split it. Uh, remember, during the year at some point, Coach Vogel had to ban him from trying to split double teams or uh, trying to split the pick and roll because he kept turning the ball over. So you're, here you are in the Eastern Conference Finals. You have to play almost a perfect game you know, to, to beat the Heat because they are that good. And they're not using the tools that would hurt them the most. And I really don't understand what this is about. So the Heat were allowed to continue to play their defense the way they normally do without having to adjust nada because the Pacers did not put them in a position to do so. So that is my big kind of a rant, I guess, and it's kind of a rant on Coach Vogel because in the very beginning of the first quarter, it was fabulous what they were doing on offense. Uh, they were getting a lot of pick and rolls um, in the very beginning and a great ball movement and just slicing up the defense. Now, on the flip side, uh, they couldn't stop the Heat for the life of them. And that was a real big problem because that's their bread and butter is the defense. And what the Heat all of a sudden unveiled out of nowhere is LeBron James posting up. Now, I had made some points in, oh, in, on Twitter in the last couple of days about, uh, about um, um, LeBron James was averaging over six post-ups a game in the playoffs last year, and that was a real big thing that turned around their, their, uh, their fortunes and, and gave them the, the uh, series against OKC. And he was down to like four a game. That's, that, that's pretty significant when you drop two post-ups a game. So all of a sudden they go to him like four or five times in a row and he literally just scores the, the easiest buckets you're going to see. Indiana refused to double, okay? And so at halftime, now you got to figure, okay, Indiana's going to have to adjust somehow and take care of the, of the, of the, of the post-ups by both LeBron and Wade because Wade had a couple too and he scored. Uh, and so basically... Uh, I think one of the reasons that Indiana got, their, got caught with their pants down and not ready for that is because they hadn't done it. They hadn't seen it for two games, and for the, the, the Heat to all of a sudden say, wait, we need to now run post-ups for LeBron, which, by the way, they should have been doing you know, from, the, from day one, it, it's, it's also mind-boggling. So all this is kind of mind-boggling, and almost kind of it feels random to me, and it's frustrating because it shouldn't be. You should have your sets. It should be organized. You should have your players on the same page ready to go, and you should call out those plays. Remember, it's not like you're calling to try and get a three in the corner. That may or may not be open if they play good defense or not. With a post-up, you send LeBron James down there, and unless they got, like, two guys in front of him, they're going to be able to at least throw the ball down there or at least show me that you're trying to run that play, okay? And that's what they weren't doing. So, cut to the third quarter, 10-point lead. This game could go either way, right? And then, the, by the way, the Pacers ended up making a run. They cut it close. The Heat run exactly one post-up for LeBron very early in the third quarter, and that was it. They completely went away from it again. I am nonplussed. If you don't know what that word is, you can look it up. Nonplussed. I don't understand what is happening on both sides. It literally doesn't make sense to me. Spolstra should be calling post-ups for LeBron James you know, very often, and uh, Vogel should be calling high pick and rolls with Hibbert and Hill. And then, and then the next line would be Hibbert in the post. And they're, they're, the fact that they weren't doing that is just, you know, is where, is where we are. They ended up winning by 18 points, blowout, not even close. So the, the, last, the, the whole fourth quarter pretty much wasn't close. It was a 20-point game. And remember, the biggest problem that the, the Pacers have is they don't score very well normally. Again, they got 96 points. It was a blowout, but they did have 30 points in the first quarter and 26 in the second. So they are actually scoring okay, but when and then their defense started to desert them. Um, I, I don't know what to say. I really, I'm really at a loss here because uh, it's not the kind of thing that I'm, you know, I, I'm used to seeing from from uh, conference finals teams. Uh, very troubling. So. Let's go walk through our usual um, screenshots of the um, of the quarter by quarter box score and see what we have here with the um, um, with the game and how it progressed. So let's get all the way back to the beginning here. If you go back in time, uh, I did some mini breakdowns. And by the way, uh, if you're not following us on Twitter, you really should because a we give you in game tweets that are really cool analysis. But I'm also tweeting um, screenshots with analysis. They're basically mini breakdowns by possession by possession. 
And so you get a lot out of that. Plus, you'll get some really interesting announcements. But then before I forget, I want to tell you, Tuesday night, at the, after the game, I can, I'll be on ESPN Radio with Freddie Coleman. So you don't want to miss that because we'll offer some insight, sort of a post-post-game show after our post-game show on Tuesday. So don't miss that because that'll be really cool, and Freddie's a cool guy. So that'll be some great stuff there. And if you forget that or didn't hear it here, if you're not on Twitter following us, you're going to miss that kind of stuff because that's where we use our – that's what we, what we rely on to give you the latest updates and news. So don't forget, Twitter, B-Ball Source on the bottom of our screen. All right, let's go through our uh, in-game analysis here. So um, we have – okay, so here's what I was showing initially. The Pacers were getting great movement. Uh, the Heat were completely over-pursuing on everything and getting – their, their rotations were really pretty bad. And so here you're going to see LeBron James came over with his man on the strong side one pass away to help on the roller, leaving an easy pass for Paul George to Stevenson for a wide-open three that he nailed, Okay. What this should have been is Haslam coming over, LeBron staying over here on Stevenson, and then uh, Chalmers sliding down to watch West. Okay, Chalmers doesn't have to doesn't have to push him out. He just needs to be there to stop the pass from getting there, which is something that even the smallest guy in the court can do. So that was a great example of this over pursuit that the Heat had will simply will not um, adjust their philosophy on defense. Um, again, here this was a um, what am I showing? Oh. Uh, a nice little uh, uh, play here where Hibbert slips the screen. So here was one of the high pick and rolls. And look at all the room he has to operate in here. Okay, they do the Pacers do a nice job in the beginning of having uh, David West bring um, Haslam low enough to be. He has to be within arm's length of him here. He can't come up too early, and so that's going to give him a lot of room to work. And I believe the next shot will show you what happens here. Yeah, he uh, Haslam does step up, but late. You can't let uh, Hibbert be that deep in the lane by the, by the dotted line. Easy pass to, uh, to West for the layup. So they were getting sliced up easily uh, in the first quarter, but on the other side, they um, they uh, they were giving up too many easy shots. Now here's another play where overhelp on the roll here. You have um, uh, again, this should be this should be. Um, it's a good question. Haslam should be stepping up on here, and he's got to stay home. So I guess the other question now is you're going to leave um, uh, West open. LeBron kind of needs to come over a little bit closer to be on the West, and then you're going to give up a shot to uh, Stevenson. It's, a, it's an interesting thing, although in theory you're going to have either Bosch or uh, Wade closing out to Stevenson. Tough, but something the, that the Heat could do. So uh, at the end of one, we had um, the Heat up by four. And you'll see both teams were shooting out of their minds. The Heat 65% led by uh, the 10 points by Chris Bosch. And, and by the way, we'll show you some, some shot charts. The, um, the Indiana Pacers were, were, would be more than willing to, sh to trade the shots they gave up. They were giving up a lot of mid-range and long twos, and the Heat were hitting them. But then on the flip side, the um, Pacers were getting either a few wide-open threes or everything else at the rim. So they, their shot chart was much better than the Heat's because they were all easy shots, easy layups, easy you know slicing up the defense. And meanwhile, the Heat were hot from the outside, and I think the Pacers would be more than willing to trade those, and knowing that they're going to start missing those shots. So that's it was a real fascinating, you know, tale of events here. How uh, uh, it's a mixture of a of uh, you know shooting from the outside versus shooting from the inside, and it was pretty even up until this point. Um, let's see here, other notables: uh, Dwayne Wade with four points and three assists, so he was doing some nice damage with uh, some penetration and kicks. Uh, meanwhile, look at this. Indiana shot 56%. Very good. Three for four from three. And, you know, at least two of those, they could have kicked them in. They were so open. So, uh, and, and they only turned the ball over four times. Actually, it's still a little bit high. Uh, it's still a little bit high, and a couple of those were unforced. So they're, they're just simply never going to get over that, that, um, that turnover problem. And what's going to overcome that is good defense, which they didn't play, and good shooting. So they were led here with nine points by George Hill. It put a very good floor game for the most part, running the show, getting uh, getting good shots. He was getting a couple of those hockey assists where he would hit the roll man, the roll man would then hit the guy for the score. So he wasn't getting the assists, but he was definitely – and then, as you can see, Hibbert was the guy who got, the, who got two of them. Uh, and Paul George got five. That's very impressive for him. Uh, didn't get too many points, but he got five assists. So they were all – running very nicely on, and, and setting each other up as a team, which is great to see offensively. So then we move to another screenshot here where, um, oh, yeah. So um, 
here is what they were doing. This is the adjustment that the, the, the Heat made. They sprung it on him in game three. Now, maybe you want to argue that you, know, you all saw um, Rocky three, right? Because in Rocky three, they trained Rocky to fight uh, as a righty. For the, for the first half of the thing, uh, the rematch versus Clubber Lang. And finally, they switched back to Southpaw, and he won. I think they were inspired by um, Muhammad Ali and the thrill in Manila. Well, maybe, maybe Spolstra sat down before the series and said, you know what, we're not going to post you up, LeBron. We're going to take our chances in the first couple games, and we're going to wait and wait, and then we're going to spring it on in game three. Maybe that's what they did. I don't know. I think it's a little strange, but maybe. Because it certainly worked. And here's what they were doing. The adjustment was that they would bring Birdman up a, a, above the, the free throw line. And what that means is that uh, Roy Hibbert has to be within an arm's length of him. And you can see here he's got – actually, it's not true. He's got about two and a half seconds to be away, that uh, far enough away, but he's got to get back to him within three seconds or else it's a defensive violation. So they post up LeBron here, bring uh, Hibbert's man out above the, the free throw line. So now it's a lot harder for Roy Hibbert to cover. My take on this should be simply that they should just double him right away anyway and get out of this position here where then Hansbro could rotate over and then D DJ Augustine can kind of play rover and have to shoot out to either his man or Battier in the weak side. It's certainly preferable to have those guys who aren't shooting well in the series shoot long shots and with maybe a guy closing out than to have LeBron James shoot layups on Paul George's face. So uh, that was their good adjustment. Now here's a good example of where they should double. Look at the spacing. It's terrible. You have Battier and Cole way too close to shoot, way too close together, and so you have um, DJ Augustine could guard these two guys. The one man could guard two. Here you have two guys that are bunched together too closely. This way you can have Sam Young play two guys with one guy. So easily you can send um, you can send uh, Mahimi, I believe that is, over to double. You can send West over to double, to, prep, which is preferable. You want a bigger guy to come over who can bother him and maybe tip the ball. So this is an example where they could have done that, and they don't. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was very telling, and it really hurt them. So um, this was another example I showed. If you can see, uh, this is not defense. Chris Bosh is somehow trying to box out Roy Hibbert as he's coming along to, to, to post up. This could hurt somebody. It could take somebody's knee out. I don't know what this is, but this ain't basketball. Okay, at the half, uh, the Heat went on a run, and they outscored them by um, – Eight points to increase their lead to 12, okay? Another 31-point quarter. So basically the Pacers' defense has been deserting them in this, in this first half. You can see they shot 61%. Now, where are we looking at? Who's who is doing all the damage here? Uh, the lead, they, they, they were very well-rounded. LeBron James got going, and almost all of those in the second quarter were the post-ups he was doing. Four for four from the line, and then he got a, uh, three assists. So he's, he's killing them from all points. This is a very well-rounded game like we've come to expect. Now, the other key here is Udonis Haslam. He got a couple shots at the rim, which is to be expected to some degree, but then, then he started nailing outside shots, which I'm sure in the first half, Vogel would have been very happy to have him take. But he was nailing them, six for seven. So now we have Birdman going crazy. He hasn't missed a shot, I don't think, forever. And you have Haslam going six for seven in the first half. That's, that's almost impossible to overcome. And he was the difference. Hassel's points, basically, it's a difference in the first half right here. Um, and then you still have Chris Bosch contributing, shooting well. Um, and at least he got two rebounds in the first half, which is better than he had in the game game two. Um, and other than that, you have uh, Dwayne Wade with 10 points. And again, everything is highly efficient. Everyone was contributing nicely. Um, so, uh, and they only had one turnover in the first half. I mean, outrageous stuff. It's a wonder they weren't up by more. Now here, Indiana ended up 50%. Now let's um, uh, let's see here. Indiana shot at the end of uh, one real quick. Uh, they shot 56%. Um, so they went down six percentage points by halftime. So they, uh, that was a normal regression to the mean. They're simply not a great shooting team like that. Uh, Roy Hibbert, three for seven. He can't be a three for seven. The guy is six inches taller than anybody else and shooting from inside of you know eight feet normally. He did contribute with his free throws, and so he had 12 points, and David West was doing some real damage down low, which is key because he disappeared in the second half. Now, remember, the thing about post-up players is that they absolutely have to rely on their guards to uh, get them shots, right? They have to rely on the guards to feed the post, and we'll show you a screenshot later where Stevenson had a nice position and just didn't give it to him. 
And that's a real problem when you have a team like Indiana that relies on post-ups and you have guys like Stevenson who aren't the best post feeders. So it's a real issue there that um, they're probably just something that's not ready. This is not a team that's ready to beat the Heat uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, it's going to be up and down. And who knows? They could turn this around. They could go back to the drawing board, get back to what they do on offense better, and then adjust a little bit with their rotations and learn how to double team a little bit better on the uh, on the low post. Now, I think that Paul George is stronger than he showed. I don't think it, it, it should have been as easy for LeBron to just simply lower his shoulder and back him down like that. And I think if they if Coach Vogel can challenge him enough, he can he can step up. Just have a little bit more force and, and and stop that better. But either way, they're going to have to double that unless they're if they if they want to win, they're going to have to. So um, let's continue our analysis here. So um, let's see here. Here's a, a the Miami shot chart. Now, as you can see, they did get a lot of shots in the uh, in the paint. A lot of these were the post ups from Wade and, and LeBron. I think there was about six or seven of those in there. And then you can see though it's kind of balanced. A lot of these mid range shots that are very inefficient on both sides of the floor. These are the shots that the Indiana Pacers are ecstatic to have shot. All of these shots. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 on this side, and another 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 or 11 shots on the left side. This is really playing right into their game plan for the, for the Pacers. They just happen to hit a few extra ones on the left side there. Uh, now, this is LeBron's uh, uh, shot chart. Kind of crazy. You let him have those kind of shots, you're in for a long night. Because remember, what we said all along is if you can keep LeBron shooting more than uh, a little bit more than half his shots from outside and, the, and Wade, too, you have a very good shot at winning. And that was what was happening in these games. They were keeping LeBron and Dwayne Wade out of the lane. That's not the case in that screenshot right there for the first half. So, uh, and then here is Indiana's screenshot, uh, shot chart. Look at that. A vast majority of them all inside the lane. That's crazy uh, stuff. And when they weren't shooting out of the lane, look at this. One, two, three, four threes, four for five for three-point land on this shot chart. And then a couple of, uh, you know, inefficient long-range shoots, but not that many. One, two, three, four, five, okay? So the Heat doubled them at least uh, with their inefficient long twos. Um, and so this was not too terrible as far as their game plan went. Um, but then in the third quarter, they abandoned their, their game plan. Here's a good example of what we're saying. Lance, uh, uh, Lance Stevenson uh, is, is, has LeBron James guarding him, which is, you know, no easy task. But there, look at this position here. Someone tweeted me, well, what about uh, Myro Chalmers in the back? You're going to come and steal it. Well, you throw it up to a 7-4 uh, Roy Hibbert, Myro Chalmers will do nothing to that pass. But he doesn't, he doesn't throw it to him. He tries to drive and then kind of kicks it and swings it. And They end up scoring out of this. I think David West gets a, uh, an M1. But still, the point is they have a shot early in the shot clock to get the ball down low and put the heat in a problematic position, and they don't do it. Um, let's see here. At the end of the three, this game was over. They outscored him by one point, and you got to, you know, Indiana actually held Miami to only 21 points, but they only scored 20 themselves. And at this point, at 15 points, this was about over at this point. You know, the, the, the Pacers weren't going to go on a big scoring binge. And again, very balanced. This is rare, I think. I, I haven't seen the Heat have a balanced stat sheet like this for a while, uh, where, you know, led by uh, LeBron, and then you have Wade with 16, um, you know, and seven assists. So, you know, that was very impressive by Wade to get into the, get involved in the mix uh, by facilitating as much as he did. And Myron Chalmers had a very nice uh, quarter as well. After just about spraining his ankle, he hit a, a bunch of nice shots. So, um, you know, they have 35 field goals, 58% shooting, and uh, 43 from three with 18 assists, uh, and, and only four turnovers. I mean, this is as efficient as you can get. Meanwhile, Indiana drops down seven more percentage points to 43%. They're shooting terrific from three-point land, but it's not a high volume. Uh, and eight turnovers, uh, you know, through three isn't isn't terrible. It's about, you know, it's good for them by far. Uh, and they have some nice balance, too. Hill had 17. Hibbert had 17. But, again, Hibbert needs probably, I think he needs more than nine shots at this point. He should have at least as many as David West. And David West kind of went back into his, uh, uh, lost some efficiency below 50%. Remember, he ain't shooting from much more than, you know, eight or nine feet for the most part. Um, and then Paul George, uh, you know, hit a couple threes, hit some free throws, um, but, you know, he didn't have as much of a factor in the, in the third quarter as I'm sure they would like. With, and then for four turnovers, was, was he has half of their turnovers. It kills them from a non-point guard. Uh, and then the final, you know, 18-point lead. This was not very close at all in the fourth quarter. 
Um, you know, you could put some solace in the fact that the Indiana held them to 23 points, which is also, you know, not a bad quarter defensively. But it, the, the damage is done. What the problem that you're going to find out with in the playoffs is that one run wins these games. You know, one big run where they get that 15-point lead, that could be it. You know, Michael Jordan hit six threes against Portland in the finals in 92 uh, in the first quarter or, like, first and second quarters. That was it. The game was over. They got a 27-point lead. They cruised to a 30-point uh, win, okay? There, it, not to say you can't come back, but uh, what we're seeing a lot of in these playoffs is that you give you play sloppy ball a little bit, you give up that one run, and that's it. That's the game. You know, th these teams aren't coming back from that, especially against the Heat. So it's a real interesting uh, problem that the, that the Pacers are going to have. So to review, what they're going to have to do is uh, adjust their, uh, their post defense and, uh, and make that really clear. If they can't do that, it won't matter what they do on offense at all. So, uh, you know, tweet your questions, answer them live right now. So, let's go to our new system here. I'm very uh, pleased to announce we have um, a new way of looking at our questions, so I'm not the guy scrolling through. And let's do this. So hopefully you guys can all see this big, and we'll go to our first question, which is, um, do you think it's troubling that the Heat, LeBron and, and uh, Chris Bosh specifically, aren't posting up nearly as often as they did last year? Um, it was troubling until this, this, until this game, absolutely. Uh, like we said earlier, um, I don't understand why they waited this long, and they made it a lot more difficult uh, you know, on them even in the earlier rounds. So absolutely, it's a problem. But, you know, it was nice to see that they, they did finally, I guess, figure it out. And um, so, yes, it, it was troubling. But listen, th you can't argue with the results uh, today. So we'll move to the next question. Which center would you rather have, Hibbert, Noah, or Marc Gasol? Wow, that's a great question. Well, you know, uh, I would have to say that Noah is, is the best defender of the three. Uh, Gasol is the best offensive player of the three. So I would probably scratch out Hibbard. Right now, I guess from where he's come, it's been impressive, but he's still got a long way to go. So he's not in that conversation yet. Um, so now it's between Noah and Gasol. Now, they're both fantastic passers. I don't, I don't even think you can say anyone is better than the other. So now what would you go with? Hmm. Ah, man, it's tough. I think I might have a go with Gasol. I, I do. But I, I love Noah. Love him. Should Anderson be a starter? Should Birdman Birdman be a starter? Well, I guess the question is, should you put Hassel on the bench and let Anderson come in? I think that coaches in this day, at this point of the season, will not change their starting lineup no matter what. So, so no, it, it won't happen. Uh, I think that the Heat have a nice thing going. If Haslam's killing them, and there were moments when he was doing like kind of his, his version of being Perkins, uh, then they could just get him in there, get Anderson in there as quickly as they can. But as it is now with the way the matchups go, they don't, they don't need him to start. It, it's a different animal if they're playing the Spurs and it's a problem. But right now, no. What we have here next. What would you rather face, LeBron in the post or LeBron's passing? Well, remember, LeBron can pass from the post. <laughs> so, um, but I think what your question is, would you rather have him attack from the, from the wing or from the post? I would rather have him on the wing all day, all night. I, it, the farther away from the post he is, the better uh, the better they are. And they better figure out a way of fronting him and then doubling him right away or else they're in trouble. So let's see here. Hi, Coach. How much more effective would Bosch be if he played in the post more like his Raptor days? I think he would be incredibly effective. On that right block, he is devastating. They don't let him get there anymore, and it's really, you know, strange. Now, you can't argue with the Heat's offensive production. They're extremely efficient. They score all this and that, whatever. Um, and so, hey, and he's doing great from the outside, but man, uh, they, they are, you know, he has made the sacrifice, I guess is what you would call it, that he is not going to be uh, a, a showcase as much as he could. And you know what, if they win another championship, maybe next year they'll kind of let him do it and just say, listen, we've got our two rings, let's find some other way to get some challenges. So I hope they do, because he deserves to, he's a good post player, he deserves to play more in the post. The Paul George pick and roll with Hibbert isn't viable for the Pacers. The Heat have been able to jam him, force bad decision thoughts. Well, if I saw enough of that, I would be able to tell you. But all I could see was 
them slicing and dicing up the Heat's defense in the first quarter and all game long in, the, in game two. So this notion of jamming wasn't a, an issue for me. They, if that's what that was, then they, they, the Pacers had better keep doing it. It was great. Uh, why they went away from this, like we talked about, I have no idea. And it's so key here, when you, rec you have to recognize the situations you're in, you, the, the, the heater on a run, you need a great shot, and you need to get it right away. You've got to call the plays that are going to get you the best shots. And the fact that they don't call the screen and roll high with Hibbert and Hill is just mind-boggling to me. It seems like in the Eastern Conference Finals that the away team plays with more confidence than the home team. Any thoughts on this? Um, that's I don't I mean I, that can't really be right, can it? Um, you know I think the Heat have as much confidence as possible, so that they're not going to be bothered too much by the road team. But you know, uh, although interestingly enough, the Spur the um, Warriors didn't get the kind of balance that they'd expected being an Oracle. Um, so you know what you, you have a point there. Uh, interestingly enough, it doesn't it makes no sense. Uh, you know the referees tend to give you better calls when you're home and all that stuff, but um, Interesting. Uh, it, it might have had that way. So let's move on to the next one here. Uh, let's see here. So you think Dwayne Wade needs to be more assertive on the offensive end, and do you think LeBron freezes him out sometimes? No, I don't think so. I think LeBron will, tends to make the best basketball play each time. He's not sort of governed by that. Um, I did think that Wade needed to make more plays, you know, overall. The way their offense works, they kind of rely on him to make the play. And he wasn't doing that as much. He was better with 18 points and then 8 assists. So that, that is really good. Uh, he needs to be near that 20-point plateau, though. They need to have that extra scoring. So, um, I, I, But I don't think LeBron freezes him out of ball at all. Let's see here. The next question is, is it just me or does Dwayne Wade look like he's scared of the paint? Well, listen, you get to a certain age and – you realize that the harder you go to the basket, the more chance you have to get injured. Mario Chalmers is a great example that he goes to the basket, kind of barrels in there, turns his ankle. He's okay, but, you know, if he wasn't so young and things were different, he might not be able to keep playing on that. So I think that Wade understands that to some degree. So I'm not so hung up on this notion of him getting all these free throws. He ended up having, uh, you know, he went two for three from the line. So I'm not looking at that as a barometer. I'm looking at it just more for points because he's got his game. He knows how to play it. Uh, he just has to make those plays, and that's all. So I don't think he's scared of the pain. I think he's playing pragmatically. How could have Indiana slowed the pace of the Heat offense? Seems like they, they did uh, fast possessions when they didn't have to. Uh, yeah, well, one of the one of the ways you can slow the Heat, the Indiana, uh, the Heat offense, is taking good shots on your end. Because if you can make enough of those shots, that kind of gets you in position where you can you can dig in and play good defense. Uh, the other things they need to do are, you know, take away some of the easier passes uh, by, um, you know, denying and, and getting better and more deflections. So it's a real interesting conundrum because you're right. Once the Heat start their moving and getting going, it's a problem. Um, and it, there's a lot – it's a hard to stop. So their whole thing, though, is, is to just to get good shots, get the pace of the game the way they want to, and be able to dig in on defense – so they don't give, you know, straight line drives to the rim. How did Haslam get all those points? Also, Wade slowly but surely looks to be coming back to form. Haslam was getting most of his points all on just spot. They're all assisted. They're all spot ups from, from penetration. And that was the other thing. The uh, Indiana Pacers defense did a very bad job keeping the ball handler from getting into the lane. They play no middle defense. They do their best to deny the, the middle so they don't get into the teeth of the, uh, uh, the defense and suck extra defenders in and they can kick out. But once they got in there, they could easily kick out. Now, here's the thing. Are they rushing at Haslam? No. They, they want him to shoot those shots. They're glad when he shoots those shots. Those are all great for him. Um, but the bottom line is he was hitting them. And that's, you know, that'll happen once in a blue moon. I don't think it'll happen again, but that's what was going uh, That was going on. And, yeah, is Wade going back to form? You know, he certainly looks good, and he's got explosion. He had that one dunk down the middle of the lane. So I, I can't imagine he's, he's, he's suffering that much right now with his knee issues. The Heat seem to have accepted to, to let Wes and Hibbert do their thing and are focusing more on the point guard and the guards, or no. Hmm. Um, that's an interesting take on that. Uh, I mean, there's no question they try and put pressure on the guards and just try and run as much as they can. You know, whether or not that hides the fact that they don't execute a lot of stuff, 
uh, is 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 to be debatable. But certainly, um, yeah, they, they just try and overwhelm you with their athletic ability and their speed. And if they get out of position because they're doing that, then so be it. Uh, West and Hibbert are going to get a few extra possessions down low. But in the in the in the long run, against the Pacers at least, they're going to win you know by 18 points. Um, but there's no doubt that West and Hibbert give them a lot of problems. And if Indiana could kind of, I think it was more of a decision. The guards just weren't they, they weren't getting in those situations like they needed to. And it's it's a thing where you need someone like you know Chris Paul has a mental toughness to be able to get his team into the right set for the most part. And you know is is George Hill having trouble with that? You know yeah. Is 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 Frank Vogel not calling those plays either and getting them organized? Yeah. So they need to learn together how to do that. Any thoughts on the Suns hiring Hornacek? Yeah, uh, I, you know what? I'm really happy for him. I think he's going to be a great coach. I mean, he always seemed like that very thoughtful guy who worked as hard as anybody to become a good basketball player. And I hope you guys remember just how great he was as a player. I mean, I think that, you know, at this point, there are enough fans out there that don't remember who he was and maybe remember him, excuse me, remember him in Utah. But I'm telling you, in Phoenix – when he went up against the Bulls when I was growing up, man, it was a, it was a nightmare to see him come and play because you, you just couldn't stop him. The guy was a fantastic shooter, could put the ball on the ground and penetrate uh, and hit floaters and pull-ups. He made life very difficult for Michael Jordan when he had a guard, for sure. You know, by the end, I felt bad when he was with the Jazz and they just post him up because he had a guard, Scottie Pippen, uh, and Pippen just posted him up and was like, you know, three inches, four inches taller than him. It was a nightmare for him, but... Man, I think he's going to be a good, you know, fundamental coach. And Lord knows the Suns need something to change their fortunes around because they're really, uh, you know, rock bottom right now. Did Miami just win game three without addressing their problems with post defense? Uh, yes, they did. They were able to get away from it because the Indiana Pacers didn't make them pay. And they didn't make them pay with, with doubling the pick and roll ball handler. Uh, and dealing with the, uh, the the role man. It's mind-boggling to me. In the third quarter, they should have had 12 possessions where they did high screen and roll with George Hill and, and Greg Hibbert. At least at least 10, mind-boggling. So we just saw them in not having to adjust, yes. Why isn't Jarrell Green getting minutes in the series? Well, from what I had seen at Jarrell Green so far in the playoffs, it was a little bit frightening. So I could see why, you know, Coach Vogel doesn't have a lot of um, uh, faith in him you got to trust the players that are going to do what you want them to do, okay? And that's what coaching really is, and that's what the player relationship needs to be evol- needs to evolve. Now, certainly you need the players to trust you, the coach, that you know, you know what he's doing, but um, that is a big part of it. But remember, the coach has to trust that if he puts the player in, he's going to be able to execute the game plan. If that trust is broken for whatever reason, either he's just scared or he's not playing well, he's just lost or he does not want to do what the coach is asking him to do, he ain't going to play. Coach, can you speak about the importance of Birdman Birdman? How big of a difference is he compared to Joel Anthony? Um, he is so much of a difference, it is frightening, okay? Um, uh, he can catch the ball, first of all. Joel Anthony cannot catch the ball. His hands are like stone. He can score the ball, which is incredible because, uh, you know, he, he hasn't missed at all, I don't think, in this whatever, and he's, and he's been a big integral part. It's almost not fair that – the Heat could somehow in the middle of the year pick up this guy to replace Joel Anthony. It's almost not fair because he's so much better than him and gives them so much better production, even on both ends of the floor because he's a terrific defender and can block shots just like Joel can. So it is frightening how much better that is. It really can't tell you. Um, so what we have next here. Oh, we lost our questions for a second. Here we go. Can we – Scroll, maybe, can we get down to the number 18? Maybe, no, maybe that might, that might be the end, actually. Well, uh, my, man, my man on the scene, Joey, I think uh, probably caught all the questions he has. I'm going to quickly um, check here on my, on my Twitter feed to see if maybe I can catch up here. Is Norris Cole a better option than Chong? Oh, here we go. We've got a few more questions. This, is, this, this will be great. We'll finish up, I think, if we can, uh, with, with this one. <laughs> Since the 2011 finals, no team. Oh, boy, we can't even read this one, unfortunately. Um, let me go back to some questions I can read real quick while we're here. Um, is Norris Cole a better option than Chalmers? You know what? I think so in the long run, and I almost feel like uh, if Cole can keep it together and continue to play better than he has in the last couple games, then next year they're going to have to take a real serious look at that because he's a better athlete than Chalmers. He can shoot. He can handle the ball. He can get to the basket better than Chalmers. 
So there's some, there's a lot of things he does better, and he's just getting you know more experience now. So it's going to be a real interesting question as his, as his playoffs develop. If Cole could continue to develop and improve, then they're going to have to make a decision about him and Chalmers in the future, and I think that Cole can do it. So um, that's a good question. If I'm Frank Vogel, what's the game plan for game four? What defense gives LeBron the most problems? Well, they don't have a zone, which is too bad, because I would love to see a zone a little bit and mix it up, because a zone, in theory, should take away some of the post-up issues, make him shoot from the outside, which is what you want him to do, and um, you know uh, that would give him a chance at least. Plus, when you switch from zone to man, it does screw up the offense a little bit. Usually it'll make the Heat get out of sorts for a couple possessions at least, and that's important. That's what you need. Every possession is important here. So um, let's see here. Do we have one I can read? Uh, since the 2011 finals, no team played zone against the Heat. That was the difference in those finals. There you go. I, you know, you read my mind. Uh, I, I'm not a huge zone fan, but with, without question, the notion of being able to have a zone um, is important. If you can do it and it's legal, it's a really great tool to, to change the game and to have, a good, to have an effect as a coach. Um, remember, sometimes you might get scored a couple times uh, with a zone defense, but then you're going to get a stop when you switch back to man and the offense needs it, uh, it takes too long to get back adjusted into another kind of an offense, the shot clock's winding down. It's those moments that you can milk out of that. So you might have let him score two out of five times, right? Well, if you, or maybe three out of five times. If you get, when you switch back to man and you stop him because of that, well, now it's three out of six times, you know what I mean? So now you're getting a little bit more efficient. It's working for you. So, um, so those are all, you know, great questions. Well, I think we're going we're gonna to call a night here. This is a great post-game show. Uh, don't miss. We'll have um, tomorrow we're not going to have a post-game show because it's Memorial Day and uh, we got family time. But I'll be live tweeting, so make sure you're on Twitter and, and following our analysis because I'll be doing that, I believe. And then we'll get right back to it on Tuesday. Don't miss. I'll be on live on ESPN Radio. We'll have a link for you, hopefully, uh, before I go on on Tuesday evening. And at the very least, we'll have the uh, link on our website with the uh, to play the MP3. So and probably put it up as a podcast, I guess. So uh, don't miss that. And um, I want to say another shout out for Joey for posting up all these questions for us. It, it went really well. I'm really happy we had that. And don't forget, we'll have the breakdown tomorrow of this game. Lots to talk about uh, with with HD video for you. And uh, let's see. Don't forget at B Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel. We're a conversation. You in?